Eda on näkynyt. Oletteko te kolme minuutin sisällä? Ehdikö käydä peheeseen? Mä käyn, pikas. Se kyllä pitäisi toimia ihan sen klikkerin ja noisten. Joo. Mut mä koitan tulla sitä. Onks Iida missä? Mä itse asiassa tiedän, että se varmaan tuolla huoneessa vielä. Aloitetaan ihan juttu. Tostakin. Mä All right, thank you for waiting and welcome to participant prep for Dash 2017. Wow, nice, nice. nice. Yeah, hi, uh, I'm Axel. And I'm Ida. And we're the co-directors of Dash. A uh, little less than a year ago, we started this project and it's just unbelievable to see how many actually have come up and realized the potential of, of Dash. Thank you all for being here. Yes, thank you. And the reason why we're actually doing this hackathon has been that we have wanted to incorporate the design thinking and research into this world of hackathons. We have a feeling that perhaps, as we all know, uh, this research is, is a crucial part of solving problems and hackathons are all about problem solving and yet Perhaps the research part hasn't been so present. Now, we're not going to be telling you what the really best ways of, and the tools for doing research is. We have a professional, real great man, Juska Teitinen, who will be presenting this. Please yes. give a warm hand to Juska. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, my name is Juska. Uh, I've been doing design professionally a little over 10 years now. Uh, right now I'm homeless. Uh, I'm unemployed. It's been like this for the past year and a half. But nonetheless, I do still teach design uh, at the universities and, and uh, also startup accelerators like this. And uh, my first reaction when I heard that uh, there's going to be uh, this design hackathon, my first reaction was something like this. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And then they told me, like, no, 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 there's going to be all these interdisciplinary people. They will be coming together, and, and uh, we will have uh, people coming from all kinds of different backgrounds. And then I still continue, like, ay, 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 ay. Why would I have such an like, a asshole reaction to something that is so nice? Well, the reason is that hackathons, they always fail. I've never seen a hackathon that is successful. Of course, that really depends on the metrics that you, you choose. 
if, if the metrics would be something like networking or having fun, meeting new people, uh, coming up with new ideas, yeah, maybe. Maybe the hackathons are successful. But if the metric is that you're actually going to find solution, so solution is not just an idea, it's a, it's a specific kind of idea that corresponds to a specific problem, then hackathons always fail miserably. But not this one. And uh, there's two reasons for that. Well, first of all, we have a really dedicated uh, group of uh, volunteers and, 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 and young people that are really passionate about it, and they've made some great uh, strategic choices uh, for the nature of, of this hackathon. So we should definitely thank all these people that have these really nice dash T-shirts, uh, who you will be interacting later today uh, during uh, the workshop. And second of all, it's because of you uh, and the things that you will be learning today. Uh, I hope this will be the first hackathon in, in the uh, history of time where, where actually people go to a hackathon prepared. And uh, today's talk will be about how to do just that. Okay, so let's see. Uh, looking for trouble, that's, uh, that's a name that I, I, I gave to this. Uh, uh, this talk. Uh, usually people don't want to get more, more problems, but if you're a designer, you really, really want to find, find problems. And uh, During this two, three hour sessions that we will be having, uh, I expect you to learn three things. First, I expect you to learn the design process in general and to understand why you have to prepare for the uh, actual hackathon event. Second, you will learn to depict or formalize the person who is having a problem. And thirdly, you will learn how to uh, describe and, and context where the problem is, is occurring. So those three things. You will understand the design process, a person who is having the problem, and the context where the problem occurs. Uh, you have probably heard at least one of these uh, abbreviations. So we have user experience, customer experience, interaction design, product design, service design, design thinking, uh, human-centered design, user-centered design, human-computer interaction, experience design, business design. The list goes on and on. And if you go to LinkedIn, you will feel, find these really fierce battles between people debating like which is which and, and how do they differ. But uh, they are all the same. For all intents and purposes, they are all the same. If you are really good at one of those, you will likely understand the uh, uh, inner workings of the others as well. So it makes no sense to, to build these kind of artificial differences between these disciplines. And um, what, is, what, what actually design tries to do? Here are three questions by Peter Drucker in his famous lecture in New York University, I think 1983. And uh, during that time, there was no word business model. There was just something that he called the theory of a business. And a theory of a business tries to answer to these three fundamental questions. First, who is your customer? Or maybe we could use, who is your user? What does the customer value? And how do you deliver that value at an appropriate cost? These three questions are the questions that design tries to answer to. If you think about design as something else, you're thinking about art. It's a different thing. And uh, yeah, later this, this evolved something during the uh, dot-com bubble that uh, we know as, as business models these days. If there's any business majors here, you may be seeing a business model canvas basically tries to reflect these three fundamental questions. So if this is what design aims to do, uh, then uh, what is something that design cannot do? So um, here we have a, a picture of, uh, with two variables. Uh, on this another axis, we have different kind of design parameters. And the other axis, we have the quality of a product. It could be also the quality of a service. Uh, but in this picture, it's named uh, the quality of a product. Let's take an example. Uh, let's think about this. This picture is about gaming consoles. And uh, uh, let's take this left mountain over here. And uh, that would represent uh, the level of computer graphics. OK? And uh, in the... Uh, uh, kind of root of the mountain, we could see some really simple gaming system, maybe the 8-bit Nintendo Entertainment System, for example, 
But as the time progresses, when, when the developers get more used to the same platform, we know that it kind of reaches the peak, like uh, th there's an increase in the quality of, of the graphics as you know, the people that are working with the system uh, get more uh, familiar with the, with the technology behind. And that is something uh, design is really good at. It's really good at this kind of climbing the mountain, okay? That's something design is extremely good at. But the thing is that if you want to find a higher mountain, something that has a bigger potential to be a more high quality of a product, design is not really good for that. For that, you have to have a drastic change, either in technology or in meaning. And I'll give an example. If you think about Ninde Do Wii, it's obvious that it didn't try to climb the good graphics mountain anymore. Like, the graphics are not substantially better than with the previous generations. But it did find a new meaning. Gaming was not anymore about graphics. It was a whole family activity. Uh, it was not just for gamers. And there was also the technological element. The gaming pad itself changed drastically. So you could use whole your body to, to uh, uh, maneuver in the, in the gaming world through different kind of accelerator meters, meters and, and so forth. And when you are able to do something that that's what we call radical innovation, when you are able to find a new meaning or, or something radical uh, in, in technology. But that is something that is extremely rare. And we don't really understand how that actually even works. My hunch is that it's based on few individuals who have a really strong idea how the world should be, or they have a really uh, interesting uh, insights to, to like human existence itself. And uh, this kind of individuals are simply just rare. And because we don't really understand how it works, there's no reason to teach it. But we do understand really, really well how do you actually climb those, those mountains up. And that's what I mean by design. So that's, that's the uh, human-centered design, which is the uh, uh, methodology that we will be using during the uh, uh, whole ethos of, of this event. Okay. Uh, so we do know that design works, but we don't know exa exactly why. Uh, the countries that... Uh, invest in design. We know that their, their economies grow faster than the ones that don't. Uh, we know that uh, companies that uh, uh, do continuously design, design cannot be just, you know, you do it every now and then, it has to be continuous. We know that those companies, they have a, a twice as high market valuation than the ones that don't. And they are especially good at exports. So they are not just selling to their own kind, but rather their products and services have a universal appeal. Um, Okay, so that's generally what design is and what it isn't, and, and uh, we have some kind of uh, agreement that it's, it's useful to do. But there are, who is then carrying out the design? So we have these three different personality traits. So we have the hipsters, who think about the desirability of the products and services. So those would be your visual designers, copywriters, for example. Then we have hackers, who think about the technical feasibility. So those would be your engineers and maybe software developers, for example. And then we have the hustlers who think about the financial viability of those products and services. Those would be your business majors, uh, for example. And I say personality traits because more often than not, uh, we come with some combination of, of these. And we really need all of these three because I'm sure uh, a hipster could in, imagine a, um, a machine that there would be a button and you push the button and it gives you money definitely a desirable product. And I'm sure there would be an engineer who could uh, build that kind of device. But then the hustler would be, that doesn't really sound qu quite viable. So, so we really need all these three working, working together. And uh, when they work together, we kind of get this uh, combination of, of, of design or, or innovation. So when hipsters and hustlers work together, we get emotional design. That's what branding and marketing agencies, for example, do. When hustlers and hackers are working together, we get process design, so standardization and optimization, something that you would see often in, in manufacturing. Uh, many things and frameworks that we use in design on a daily basis were actually originally from the auto industry, especially from Toyota. And then uh, maybe past 10, 15 years, the combination of hackers and hipsters has become uh, extremely uh, prevalent because of the uh, emergence of, of different kind of digital services. So that's functional design. So usability and interactions, something that you would see uh, pretty much every time you open your, your smart device. And uh, yes, so 
uh, all of these three together make a really balanced design team. So, uh, as you are formulating and uh, during the, uh, uh, the actual uh, hackathon event in, in a couple of weeks, uh, be mindful that you have all these uh, things checked out. Then you would be at least uh, aware of the uh, potential, uh, uh, how would I say, blind spots in your team. And also, like in the future, when you are working as lead designers and, and you are gathering up design teams, make sure that you have heapsters, hackers, and hustlers working together. So, those are the people that are doing design. Uh, few words about team dynamics, because I mean, when we kind of imagine designers, we have these big egos and, and personalities, but uh, frankly, that doesn't really make really good design teams. So you have to kind of uh, balance this, um, something between being passive and, and, and aggressive. Don't combine those, that's bad. Be assertive. That's when the performance peaks. So in every design team, there will be uh, disagreements on either what the decision, design decision should be, or how that design decision should be done. Uh, generally speaking, all these conflicts are, of course, opportunities, uh, because if they are being resolved in a, a respectful manner, that usually builds the uh, team cohesion and, and enhances your, your productivity and performance. Really small things, never say but, always say and. It's a really, really difficult thing to do. I struggle with that every day, just to kind of swallow that but and just change it to and. But it makes a huge difference when you're giving criticism to your uh, uh, teammates. And these are great uh, kind of life lessons from Dale Carnegie. He, he made the uh, most best-selling self-help book, uh, How to Win Friends and Influence People, in the early 1900s. The most sold self-help book to date. And uh, he gave these three uh, guidelines. So never criticize, condemn, and complain, because that's super easy. It's so easy to criticize, condemn, and complain. Give honest and sincere appreciation, like make the other people really feel that you, know, you, you care about them. And arouse the, in the other person an eager to want. It doesn't matter what you want. It only matters what the other people want. If you are able to make them want the things that you want, you're going to do really, really good. So, I mean, it's a bit of a smoke and mirrors, but this is just how we humans work. And uh, I've really had to uh, learn these lessons by the hard way. Like, so many times I've looked customer in the eye and I thought, like, I'm wrong. And, and, and like, you know, it's, um, I've lost a lot of money doing, doing some stupid stuff, like saying out loud that I'm right and, and you are wrong. You should never say that, even though if that would be the case. Okay. So... Now we have some idea of what I mean by design. Uh, we have an agreement that it's useful. We know who are doing design. Uh, next we are going to check out what are the steps that are required for design. It's not magic. There's really a step-by-step process for doing design. Okay? Uh, here's a picture I, I, I draw some years ago when I was working as a young designer in, in, in one agency. And, uh, I was kind of bothered by the fact, like, hundreds of people working here, a lot of designers, and I didn't really understand, like, why do we do things in a certain order? I think it wasn't really communicated in a, in a right way, so, so one, one day when I was wasting my employer's money, I drew this. Uh, it's just a picture of, of different faces that I identified uh, back then. Uh, it has seen many revisions since then, but what I urge you to do, this has been, for me, an extremely helpful tool. What I urge you to do is to kind of um, uh, start sketching out your own idea of what design process actually is, and kind of make that as a basis for your own mental model what design is. And then, as your career progresses, keep updating that, that model. You will really understand the different dynamics of that, and that will enable you to teach your idea of the design process forward. It gives you great ownership and it works as a great learning tool. Uh, but in the simplest possible form, this is the design process. Research and development. First you research and then you develop. Okay? So during the actual hackathon event, that will be the development part. But before the event, you have to do the research part. 
Uh, in reality, these are actually things that after you develop, then you research again, and then you develop, and, and so forth. And this is something that should take, we don't quite know, like, this is something Aristotle was already uh, trying to figure out thousands of years ago, like, what would be the uh, right kind of uh, phase when you should change from researching to developing and, and vice versa, and we still don't quite know. But it seems the quicker, the better. Uh, this is how processes, generally speaking, work. You put something in, then there's a set of rules, like an algorithm, for example, and then something comes out. This is how your burger joint works. This is how your uh, code works if you program something. This is how, how any process works. And the uh, processes themselves, they have this kind of fractal quality in them. So within processes, there's sub-processes, and in them, there's more processes, and, and so forth. So you can zoom in and you can zoom out. And uh, that's the nature of, of processes. And uh, this is kind of the archetype of what design processes are. First, there's a part of analysis, that's the research, and then there's the synthesis, and that would be the development, okay? And uh, in the 70s, we formulated this in a bit different manner, like uh, instead of talking about uh, analysis, we can talk about di divergent thinking. So that's when you kind of put your mind into all these di different directions. You don't limit your, your imagination and so forth. And after that, you do convergent thinking. So you pull all those ideas together and form something more tangible. Uh, you could also say it's about establishing needs and then satisfying those needs. Okay? And again, the hackathon event will be about satisfying needs. But before you can do that, you have to establish those needs. And this is the tragic realization that every design student has to come one day. The better you understand the problem, the less freedom you have to how to solve that. I say that again. The better you understand the problem, the less you get to choose what to do next. Everybody thinks design is about self-expression, taking your own soul and, and putting it out. It's not. It's actually finding what is the right solution. And there is, there is ways to quantify, quantify what design is. I come from visual design background, and it hurts to say, but visuals don't actually matter that much. The color doesn't matter that much. It's all about understanding the problem, and as you do, the solution will come evident. But that is not to say that you cannot take pride of becoming really good at this. Generally speaking, people suck at this. Like, I don't know, if you took a public transportation here, I tried to pay your ticket with the machine, you know what I'm talking about. It's all about understanding the problem, and as you do, the solution will emerge. And this is the reason why those hackathons, how often they fail. People go there, but they don't understand the problem. There will be, of course, great ideas. Like, everybody will feel great. They get free beer and pizza, and, and they get to talk about what they are good at. But it doesn't solve the problem. Um, it might also be that the idea of analysis and synthesis being a separate things is completely false. Because it seems that human mind is actually able to do both of them at the same time. And based on my personal experience, I think I can sign this. But it seems that in the beginning of the design process, there's more analysis, and in the end, there's more synthesis. So it's more like a continuum as it goes, goes by. And this is something amazing that human mind can actually even do that. Uh, so, okay, so analysis and synthesis were kind of the uh, <coughs> basis for design process. And of course, it, it you know, evolved to something more intricate uh, as time uh, went by. So in uh, Koberg and, and Bagnall in 1972 started to kind of break it down to these different steps. So they realized that between analysis and synthesis, there should be one point where you actually define what you just analyzed, okay? And then they broke down the synthesis into uh, points of ideate, select, and implement. And then because they were working in a commercial environment, they first put there, there has to be the accepting the actual that we are going to actually do this. Surprisingly, many clients, they refuse to actually like access the fact that we are actually going to do something. And then evaluate, of course, you want to see whether you could en enhance your performance. And from these, we got something called the 4D software processes. They come from these four words, define, design, develop, and deploy. Now, if you're looking for a job in a design agency, all of them will claim that we have this unique design process, which is the best and the most beautiful. But if you really think about it, they're actually all the same. They just change the words, like maybe they don't talk about discovering, but 
They're, they have different words for, for this. But most, if not all, uh, design agencies, they use a variation of this. Somebody might you know, add a few words there and there, but they are all the same. So use this as a lens when, when you are trying to evaluate your maybe future employ, uh, employer. And um, in, in recent years, um, I think it's not more than 10 years, Design Council released this, the double diamond model. It's, uh, it's a pretty good model. It, uh, it combines two things. First, you have the four Ds, discover, define, develop, and deliver. Really nice phases. And also the, uh, uh, the illustration uh, emphasizes the idea of the divergent and, and convergent thinking. And it also shows the different stages that you have to first have the uh, problem definition before you can go to the solution. And this has become an, uh, extremely influential, and I have nothing against this one. This is the one that we are officially using for the event, and I think that's a justified call. It's well known, it works, there's hardly anything unnecessary here. But remember, the hackathon event will be about the uh, diamond on the right. What happens before that, which starts today, is the, uh, uh, is the first half. And today you will be thought how to uh, discover and define those problems that then you can solve in the hackathon. Uh, D school in, in Stanford University, they had this one. They added the really uh, uh, fashionable word, empathy, in the, uh, in the design process. Uh, everybody says that designers have to have empathy. I disagree. I think you can be a psychopath and still be a great designer. You don't have to care about the user but you have to know how their mind works. But maybe it's good to be empathetic as well. Uh, if somebody wants to have a really, how would I say, constructed uh, approach to design, so this is, from, this is an ISO standard, uh, human-centered design process from uh, a standard which works with different kind of ergonomics. It first started to just do how to design an actual place where a person uses a computer like 50 years ago or something, but then it has evolved into, into this that we use nowadays to, to do software, for example. Basically, it has just the same, same uh, stages. First, you understand the context, to specify the user requirements, then you make solutions that uh, uh, answer to those, those needs, and then you evaluate, and if, it's, if they correspond, congratulations, you have officially made a human-centered design uh, which satisfies the user needs. This is the way I like to depict it nowadays. Uh, I like to use the words tension and relief, just like in stories. Like if you think about all great stories, there's always the tension in the beginning. It might be somebody wants to destroy the ring, uh, somebody wants to become a great wizard, and the whole story unfolds as we are trying to relieve that tension. And I think that's a really great way of uh, formulating the design process uh, from the point of view of people who participate, because they feel that they are engaged in a story. You can think about your user as a hero. But there's also the analysis and synthesis, and I like to turn them into these questions. Like first, what is everything kind of made of? What are the different pieces of puzzle that we need to understand, uh, which constitutes the problem? What does it mean? Which of those pieces are more problematic than the others? And only after that we can go to the uh, Imagine the future. What if things would be this and this way? And of those ideas, we choose the ones that are actually up to the task, so we ask what actually works. And again, the right side, save it for the hackathon. Left side, in preparation. Okay. Uh, does everyone have a clear idea about design process at this point? Maybe, yes. Good. My first job as a designer was actually in the army, and I really learned how to, you know, screw things in a, in a really, uh, uh, in a way that they can be misinterpreted. Okay. So, how do we answer those first questions? Who is the user and what do they value? That's where design research comes in place. Number one remedy against hard-boiled developers, arrogant designers, and tight-fisted executives. Uh, data is really difficult to argue against. Uh, if you agree on the way that that data has been acquired, this does really good for your team cohesion. Everybody can agree. This is what the users actually want. It's not an opinion thing anymore. So, highly recommended to do. Here's a 
picture that I, I found lying in the internet. So this is something called the user persona. So you're trying to define two things. I, I thought I'm, I'm going to teach you three things. First was the design process, we got that. And then how to depict the user. And thirdly, the context. So this is the user part. This is one depiction of that. You can see there's all kinds of information. There's a picture, there's a name, uh, what kind of devices does this person use, what does she do, what she never does, uh, some kind of uh, quotes from her, uh, etc. This one is imaginary. This hasn't been used in any, any real context. But they are used. Uh, this is uh, from the uh, uh, city of Helsinki's uh, city strategy that was published not too many months ago. And uh, based on that, they've been creating these different kind of personas. They've been doing actual research and, and they identified these kind of people, which they then use a basis to develop the city further. They always sound a bit sketchy, like I'm Mike, 27 year old, you know, I do UX design and on my free time, blah, blah, blah. But still, I mean, uh, this is something that is really useful and it's been used on, on daily basis. So, what is the information that is being captured on these fancy looking? Uh, uh, depictions. Three things. Demographic information. You need to understand the demographic information of your user. So their name, their gender, where do they live, how much money do they make, what kind of family they have, for example, what kind of education, that kind of stuff. Something that you can count. Then you need to understand psychographic information. What kind of values do they have? What do they believe in? Do they have some kind of specific principles in their lives? So that's more like a zodiac sign kind of thing. And thirdly, and most importantly, which I often see forgotten from these depictions of personas, is the roles. Within one psychographic and demographic group, we might still have many different roles. Right now my role is, a, uh, I'm, I'm a lecturer. A role has an audience. I'm uh, literally performing the role for you guys. A uh, role has a front stage where the role takes in place, this stage here. Uh, role has a pack stage where I prepare for, for, to perform my role. In this case, it could be a literal backstage where I polish up my slides before I start, or it might be the trip here in a bus when I'm listening to some you know, upbeat music to kind of get me pumped for the uh, event. And role also has props that support that role. I wear all black, I have boots, I have this hipster stuff on me. That reinforces the image that, yeah, that guy might be a designer. I used to have mustaches, that was really good, not anymore. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, oftentimes, it is these props when they fail. Uh, then there's a good opportunity for a solution. Uh, I think uh, men's uh, dress shirt with a, with a tie, that's a great prop because if you have work, I mean, you can look really tidy and so forth, but you can loosen up the tie when you go out. That's a really corresponding and a responsive uh, prop to have. So you really want to understand these three things about your user, the one that you are designing for in the actual event. So this is the user part. Then we also have to understand the context. And there actually is a great way to understand context. So this is from 1984, Harvard Business Review, uh, January issue. And that was the first time when something called the service blueprint was introduced. Uh, here we can see a blueprint for a corner shoe shine shop. So we are depicting the process of you know, how a person is shining shoes. We can see that it takes 30 seconds to shine the shoes. Then you apply polish for 30 seconds. Uh, there's a potential fail point there if you um, put a wrong color of wax. And then you have to do the cleaning of the shoes 45 seconds. Then you puff and you collect the payment. And uh, this is what the customer sees like over the line. And under the line, there's something called the line of visibility. So, of course, in able to polish those uh, shoes, uh, you have to buy these different kinds of supplies. And this is, of course, something that the uh, user or the customer, in this case, doesn't see. But it's still essential for that thing to happen. So this was really a simple uh, depiction of, okay, there's different inner workings when it comes to services and products and so forth. And it has evolved. Uh, this is, again, an uh, example I, I found online. Uh, you can see that there's other things that have been added, like there's uh, illustrations and so forth. Uh, I think this is trying to... Yes, this is actually depicting uh, a barber shop visit, I think. So there's... Uh, uh, in the uh, upper row, 
the customer and the uh, provider are uh, uh, having a dialogue about the needs of the customer. And, and uh, there are different kind of uh, processes for the provider uh, from s scheduling and you know preparing coffee for the customer, cutting the hair and collecting money and, and so forth. And there are different kind of super processes like you need electricity in every stage of the process or you have to have an a internet browser and, and uh, something to, to collect the money from. And uh, these service uh, blueprints, I think this is the most important tool I have in my daily design work. This is so amazingly useful. And uh, of course you can make these pretty pictures with clients love. Mm, I think maybe a bit of waste of time. You can just use an Excel. Today we will be using post-it notes. So we have identified there are some core, these are called like swimming lines that you should depict. The first is actions, so the actions that the user has to take in every step of the process. Uh, which thoughts and emotions they have during each of these uh, things. So if I give you an example, like if I would be going to a dentist, okay, so the thing starts when in the middle of night I will have a lot of pain in my mouth. And then the next action would be when I wake up, I will pick up my phone and you know make a reservation and uh, then eventually I go to the dentist office and they will give me the treatment and after that I will be possibly quite happy. So thoughts during that uh, uh, experience, of course, in the beginning I'm probably a bit worried and maybe even confused, like where do I find the treatment? During the treatment, maybe I feel a bit uncomfortable because it hurts when they drill and so forth. But after that, of course, I will be really happy because they give me free toothpaste and toothbrush. Uh, then I also think about the touch points or the physical evidence. So in the beginning, uh, you know, everything takes place in my home. Uh, when I'm looking for that uh, dentist office, uh, maybe that happens on my tablet computer. Then the actual um, uh, appointment takes place in the uh, hospital or, or whatnot. Okay. Then I also need to map the on-stage and backstage personas. So on-stage persona would be someone I'm interacting directly. So if I would be in a restaurant, that would be the waiter or the waitress. And the backstage person is someone who is also relevant for the experience, but who I cannot see, like a chef in an example of, of a restaurant. And then there's all kinds of super processes and systems that I needed. So those are kind of the internal uh, interactions that happen. And there might be other stakeholders too. So if I'm going to a dentist appointment, uh, in the beginning my first uh, thought might be like, okay, maybe I have a small daughter home. Like, how do I get them to, to be babysit during the uh, uh, treatment and so forth? And as you map this out, you can see that there will be kind of unhappy smileys every now and there. And those are the opportunities that you are looking for. That's where you're going to design for. Again, this is something that people lack before they go to hackathons but not you, because you're going to do it, okay? Uh, how do you answer to these questions? How do you feel those? Like, how can you be confident that, that uh, the answers that you put on those, those uh, service blueprints and personals is, is legit? Well, first, this is something that's really important to know. There's a huge difference between attitudes and behaviors, or what people say and what people actually do. If you ask, what did I do yesterday, I will say you. I went to gym, I ate healthy. In reality, maybe I went to disco, did some stupid stuff, you know? There's a big difference what people say and what people do. Especially when it comes to controversial topics. And if you're making interviews, like people will do surprisingly long lengths to, 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 to look good in your eyes. That's just how we people work. So be mindful, but these are two completely different things. You cannot just ask, you have to also observe. And from this, you can get two different kinds of data. Qualitative, uh, that's kind of direct insight, something that you see with your very own eyes. Uh, answer the question, what kind? It also gives you insights why things are happening. Or then quantitative data, so that's something indirect, something that you can count, uh, asking how much. That's something you get from, uh, from different kind of systems, like if you have a digital product, for example. So from these, we get generally speaking, four different kinds of research methods. If you think about qualitative data about attitudes, obviously you can just ask. That's interviewing, okay? If you want to qualitative data about behaviors, you can observe. You become this ninja. You just, if you are designing a new grocery store, you actually go to your nearest Aleppo and, and see what people are actually doing there. Then quantitative data about behaviors. If you have, again, digital product, uh, you can track people. 
like see actually what they do within your digital service. Uh, of course, there's other means of tracking people as well, using cameras and so forth. And if you want to have a quantitative data about attitudes, you can always make huge surveys, online surveys. They cost nothing. That happens all the time. When you're using your favorite web shop online, there will be a pop-up saying, like, would you have a few minutes? That's what's happening there. Okay? The problem that uh, designers often have is that they are not working with this full spectrum of, of, of these research methods. But uh, with you guys, only two are necessary. User interviews and field studies, so the observations. First of all, this qualitative stuff is cheap. It's quick. It, it's good enough to give you, uh, you know, steps forward. You can worry about the quantitative stuff later when you have a prototype and, and, and so forth. But there are many other methods as to There's at least 20. But uh, those two which I mentioned earlier are the ones that I always go to. Okay. And how many people should you should you observe or interview? People will say if they study marketing, hundreds of people. Not true. Five is enough. If you have a really, if you have specific user group and a specific problem space, with only five users, you will find 85% of the uh, uh, usability problems within that within that context. Only with five people. And uh, but there's of course a trick. You cannot assume that the severity and frequency are related. So, for example, let's say that you are a phone manufacturer from Korea, and every thousand of mobile phones will explode in your pocket. Obviously, you don't find that with five users, okay? But no one has a limited, uh, unlimited budget, at least if you're working for a private sector. So, if you have a limited budget for making those user uh, studies, rather than studying, for example, with those thousand uh, users, you can divide that into 200 Oh my God. Yes, 200 uh, five user groups. So rather do often with small batches than one big batch. Okay? And if you're doing qualitative research from statistical, uh, uh, quantitative research from statistical point of view, about 20 users uh, will give you uh, good enough results for, for going further with your development. Okay? So if you have two weeks from now, no one can have an excuse that you wouldn't have time to engage with five people. Okay? That's something you can do in one afternoon. What do you need? Mobile phone, P0, pen and paper. So you all have the tools to map these things out. It's not difficult to do interviews. It's not difficult to spy on people. It's actually quite fun. <clears throat> OK. Now I give just an example. So yeah, there's the mushtas. OK. Not a good idea, right? Yeah. <laughs> but it gave credibility. So uh, this summer, uh, I wasn't homeless for the whole time. I actually had to rent a place because uh, a Japanese company, they, they really wanted to, me to teach design. So they flew their team to me here for one weekend. And I, and, uh, I gave them a, a crash course on design during two or three days. And uh, these people, they knew about what design is, but we could say that they were new to the craft. And uh, of course, they never used the uh, card reader for the uh, Finnish uh, public transportation. So we took that, that as a challenge show. Do a redesign for that machine. So what did we do? We followed the design process. First, we went to Arkioski to buy the travel card. And then we went to different drams and buses to try them out and observe other uh, travelers and, and, and trying it out themselves, like uh, what might be the hiccups with this system. There was plenty. And based on that, we created these two personas. So on the left, I think, she was a tourist, didn't speak the language, uh, but wanted to see sightseeing for, for a week. And the person on the right, uh, I think he was working and, and he needed to do the work commuting uh, with the travel card. And we mapped those th same things, so demographic information, geographic information, and the role. And this is something that you will be doing today. After that, we mapped out the, uh, uh, the context, so we did the service blueprint. As you can see, it can be really crude and quick. This is something that we will be doing today. On the uh, uppermost row, there's again the actions. So the guy notices that there's no money on the card. He has to locate a kiosk where he can uh, do the uh, recharging. Uh, puts 20 euros on the card, goes to the bus, and the bus he's severely disappointed because he has an adult card, so he cannot pay for his child. Real use case. You cannot pay for children with an adult card. 
and we map out the, uh, all the emotions during the way. And of course, there was confusion how to find the right Ark Joski, and, and he was furious when, when he wasn't able to, uh, to pay, pay for the kit. So these are obviously the uh, uh, things that you are trying to look for, because those are opportunities for design to take place. And we also map the different places where, where everything is taking place. So there's the physical place of home, the uh, bus stop, uh, the uh, digital machine, and, and so forth. Okay. After that, and this is now, now we are going, now we establish the, uh, the user and the needs, so now we are going to the, uh, uh, the actual design part of creating those new ideas. So this is something that would then take part in the actual hackathon. So we started sketching out different uh, kind of uh, user interfaces that could uh, solve some of the issues that we saw. And uh, then we chose the ones that we thought like uh, were most likely to succeed. Based on those, we did quick uh, mockups, and uh, then we did uh, just a quick clickable prototype. And finally, we went to a bar and let people test it out. And uh, we were able to push the uh, five-step process into two steps, and the satisfaction was way higher than with the normal machines. And people who were actually quite drunk were still able to use that. And that's a, that's a good sign, because, I mean, when you're drunk, your cognitive functions go down, and if you're still able to use it, it's good design, okay? So, this was something that was done with people that, with no uh, prior exposure to, to what design is. So design is something that with good design management skills, so if you are following the process and, and are using best practices, uh, you are able to empower very, how would I say, normal people to do the stuff. I don't think in the future there will be great designers. It's, it's, designers will be more like uh, facilitators in this, this job. Okay. Um, Everything clear now? Okay, yes, yes, good. So, now we're gonna do this, start doing the exercise. So, um, we should now divide in the groups. Uh, how many people we have present? 60. 60 people. Should we do groups of six? Should that would work? Okay. Uh, if anyone has been in the army, you know what luku kymmenen means. So, Starting from here, I want you to count to 10. Okay, like one, two, three, you get the idea. And uh, then number ones go into one table, number twos go to another table, and so forth. And because there will be 10 groups, uh, I think we can all fit in this space. So, so there's uh, uh, tables behind you and also in the uh, uh, upper deck, okay? So you can hear my voice. And once you get into those groups, uh, there will be A4 papers and there will be post-it notes. And we will be starting by taking one of those papers, folding it half, so you will have two pieces. And on the left side or right side, I want you to start depicting the demographic information about your user. So, in your group, you have to think about somebody who has a problem. And believe me, like everybody has a problem. It can literally be anyone. Everybody has some kind of problem. If it's related to, to the uh, upcoming event, why not? But I mean, sometimes it's, it's just, you know, good to have fun. Uh, I've used these things to design great dates, so that kind of stuff also works. Uh, but yeah, just pick someone who has a problem and then start to fill the demographic information on the other half of the piece of paper. So name, age, like really make that person feel alive. You can do illustrations, you know. I, I, before this, I've, I've usually used PDFs that have really clear in, instructions like how to fill them. But today I have a lot of faith in you. I want to give you as much uh, leeway as, as possible. So, I don't know if, if you like Taoism like I do. Uh, Lousy thought us that uh, cup, if you have a cup that is made of clay, uh, it gives, gets its function from the uh, shape and the amount of clay. But uh, it becomes useful because it's empty. Same thing with, with, uh, with this room. Like, it gets a function from the walls, but it's useful because it's empty. So same thing goes with these empty papers that are uh, being provided to you. So first you put that demographic information to the other half. And then you wait maybe five, ten minutes, and then I will give you more uh, instructions. Everything clear? Okay, good. And let's then start counting to ten. One, two, three, four, five, six. Who was that? 
Oh, eight? Ten? One? Three? Four? Five? Six? You're six? You're six? Seven? Eight? Nine? Ten? Two? Three? Four? Five? Six? Perfect. Exactly. 60 people. Okay. So, uh, maybe number ones, number twos, number threes, number fours, number fives, number six. Okay. You can do it. So teams from f team six, seven, eight, nine, and ten go upstairs. Teams one, two, three, four, and five stay downstairs. Okay. So 10 minutes to figure out the demographic information of a person of your choosing in your team having a problem.
läpi jotain tässä niinku lavalla? Ei, nyt mä käyn vaan niinku suoraan. No, no, Tuleeko se nyt tonne? No niin. All right, five more minutes. Demographic information. Your person should have a name, age, where do they live, do they have a family, what do they do for a living? Five minutes.
saaks ma vahetu üle? Saaks ma slaidu vahetu üle? Ma tarvin vaan seal, kas vahetu. Mene kas tuud? of the paper that you folded. Now start filling out the psychographic information. So, about what kind of principles does your per person have? Like, do they have some kind of rule they live their life with? Uh, what kind of attitudes do they have? Are they introverted or are they, are they extroverted? Like, something that defines their personality, okay? It might be, you could maybe draw what do they have in their pocket, for example. Something that depicts what kind of person they are, so psychographic information. And for this you only have five minutes because you already know each other. I can see there's mingling going on. So five minutes, psychographic information on the other side of the paper. Okay?
two more minutes. Two more minutes. All right, can I have your attention? So, now you have already familiarized yourself with your persona who has some kind of problem, okay? That's the first step. It's, it's really good that you are kind of building this imaginary a picture in your head, who this person really is. It really helps when you kind of have this idea of a real being rather than just someone from the demographics, like someone between 20 and 25 and you know, something like average is much better to have something that is concrete. And now, on the separate paper, for this same person, I want you to depict uh, his or her role. So the role where they will likely encounter the problem that you have in mind. Don't worry, the problem doesn't have to be that defined yet. Just think about the role where they might uh, encounter the problem. So the role, of course, has a, some kind of name what the role actually is. But think about also the front stage. Where does that role take in place? Think about the backstage. Where does your persona prepare to play that role? Think about the audience. For whom are your persona trying to, to perform the role? And think about the props. What physical things, for example, are essential for that role to carry out? Okay? And you have 10 minutes for that, okay?
All right. Three more minutes. Three more minutes. All right, uh, time is up. Really good job. I'm I'm extremely uh, impressed. I, I kind of have a feeling that it might be that you guys have been doing this before, but... <laughs> now it works. Okay. So, really, really good job. Uh, I think uh, you are really gathering the... Uh, the uh, idea of, of a persona, and that was... Jeez.
All right, if people could move over to grab some, their seats and be ready again. Uh, we'll continue actually on stage for a little bit. So if you move to the chairs at the stage or just sit in the, no, okay. Just, just sit where you are, that's fine. You can go to the workshop. Uh, you can you can sit by your workspaces. That's fine. As long as you can see what happens on the screen, that's all that we care about. So if you, as long as you can see the screen, you, yeah, you, you just move those to the side so that you can see the screen. Um, we'll be. Continuing shortly. Now, before I let Yul Scott take the stage again, uh, a couple of things. So, w not only are we having this uh, prep event, but we do want to provide you with some background information about all the different challenges. Uh, and the different fields of design. So we'll be sending out emails to each and all of you, each and every of you guys um, soon. Maybe not tonight, but early next week. So you'll get some background information. It'll help you out to do the research on your own and actually get in depth in what, what this is all about. So that will be sent out to each and every one of you. Uh, we'll post it on Facebook and on Instagram as well when we've sent it out. So if you don't receive it, just let us know. All right, but without further ado, let's continue. All right, thank you. So I told you when we began this day that I will be teaching you three things. Those were the uh, design process, a thing that you uh, after having small discussions with you guys during the break, uh, it seems that all of you have crashed really well. Uh, then the second thing was to teach you how to depict a person who is having a problem, something that I can see that all of the teams have successfully already done. And the third thing, the thing that we are going to do next, is to understand the context where the problem actually happens. Okay, so earlier I mentioned the idea of service blueprint. So those different depictions of, of uh, all the building blocks of, of the uh, service experience or product experience, what have you. And uh, I want you to do the same. So we are going to go swimming line per swimming line. So each of the teams should have post-it notes. And uh, um, it might be a bit tricky to work on a table surface, but it's definitely possible. Uh, if you can, you can also use wall space next to your... Uh, next to your table. Uh, it might be a bit easier to work that way. Uh, depending on the uh, post-it notes, they either stick or they don't. So, But that's, that's just how the life is. So we start by mapping out actions, so the user actions. So you have an idea of your user. You have an idea of their, their problem. And now I want you to make this kind of comic strip of that problem occurring, OK? So you take post-it notes and try to draw each stage when that problem takes, takes uh, uh, place. Is that simple enough? So you make one row of post-it notes. And you have to leave room under that, maybe six post-it notes are worth of space. So maybe 60 or 70 centimeters or so uh, under that. So, but we, we start with the first line. And I'm only going to give you five minutes to do that. And everybody can draw. I know, everybody can draw. If I see someone with not a pen in your hand, I will come and make you take the pen. So, so but yeah, let's start with the, with the action. So comic strip of your user having a problem. You have five minutes to complete this.
I give you three more minutes. Three more minutes to finish up the comic. All right, then to the next swimming line, okay? So now you have mapped out all those uh, different stages of a problem occurring. Next, I want you to map out the thoughts and emotions of your user in all of those different stages. I recommend you to use emojis, for example, from your phone, like smiley face when they're having a good time, poop emoji when they are not having such a good time, and you can also put like thought and uh, thought bubbles to uh, write out what they actually are thinking. But use some kind of emojis for each step of the uh, of your story. Okay.
to go to the next swimming line. So touch point or physical evidence. So something tangible that is a reminiscent of that specific stage to occur. For example, if it's a stage that someone is making a reservation online, for example, maybe the touch point would be a, a desktop computer or mobile phone. Uh, if it's something that is taken in, in, a, in a more like physical environment, then it could be a restaurant, so you draw a house. But something tangible that is relevant for that specific stage to occur. Again, five minutes.
sitten lasku. kovin kummonen. Saa, mut sit se siis puun ulos tuumaan se ei saa paljon enempää. Alright. So, next swimming line. This would be the on stage person. So now it might be that there is not a post it for every stage of your process, but whenever your user is directly interacting with someone, here would be the place where you actually put that that uh, another person. So, for example, if I go to the restaurant, the first person would be uh, 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 some kind of concierge who's, you know, uh, letting me know whether there would be a table ready. Next, it would be the waiter, that kind of people. So, someone that I'm directly interacting in specific stage of the process. It doesn't have to necessarily be face to face. I mean, if you're calling somewhere, it might be some another person on the other side of the phone, but someone that the user or the or your persona is directly interacting with. Uh, maybe three minutes is enough. Yes. All right, almost there, almost there, only three to go, okay? So next, backstage person, same thing as before, but this is someone that your persona doesn't see. So if they would go to the restaurant, that would be the chef. Really integral for that experience to happen, but someone they never see directly, okay? And again, it might be that there will be some blind spots, like there is no backstage persons every time, okay? 
two minutes. Two minutes. All right, and for the two remaining one, let's combine those. I mean, I can see you already, you're doing very, very well. I don't have to steer you anymore. So, support processes and systems. If there's any technology behind, is there a bird here? There is. A, <laughs> there's a, uh, so, any support processes and systems. So, uh, if there's some kind of technical system behind, like, for example, if I would have a barber shop, uh, and then there's uh, the moment when I'm uh, making the reservations. Of course, there would be software or some kind of online tool that I would be using. And if that wouldn't function, I would be in trouble. Uh, same thing, uh, if I would be running a restaurant, the support process would be uh, some supplier that takes the meat and, and uh, vegetables and whatnot to the place. So map out all the super processes that, that might exist. And then the last one. If there are any other stakeholders that you can think of that are uh, affected by any stage, family members, uh, society in, in a greater meaning, anything, map them there, there as well. And for these last two, I give you five minutes, okay?
Ding, 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 ding. Okay, time is up. Everybody did a great job. Everybody did absolutely great job. Now, if I could have your attention uh, for a few more minutes, uh, could you gather around back to the uh, front stage? Could you come back, take the seats, okay? All right. You did really well. I've done a lot of these kind of uh, workshops. And I have a feeling that every time they, uh, the participants get quicker and uh, more to the point when doing these exercises. So definitely, really, really good job. I think every team did uh, uh, a good job. And actually, there were a few teams that if I would have my own design studio, I would be keen to having some talks. But does this picture now make more sense to you? Like, more you understand the problem. That is exactly what you've been doing. So, you can see that the solution starts to emerge. I'm sure that all of you started to all think like, hey, I could maybe solve this thing using this part from the uh, service blueprint, from another part. And so, in, it's so important to, to map out all of those things because it might be an unexpected place where you find the opportunity to solve the problem. And these are living documents. I highly recommend that when you do this, you use some cloud-based service, have a shared Excel with your team and some kind of version control and, and, and you know, make them more accurate as the time goes by. And I hope that also gives you uh, insight uh, how this actually, the, the importance of this step uh, in the uh, whole big picture of, of doing design. So these two exercises that you were doing today are on the left side, so you are defining the problem, uh, creating a design brief, which then you can solve at the actual hackathon event. But, oh, I, I should say and, I, I should have said, okay. <laughs> uh, and, uh, right now, those things that you have mapped out, uh, they, are, they are good guesses. They are educated guesses. I mean, m many of those reflect your own experiences, and as such, they are valuable. They hint you the right direction. 
But if you want to make sure that you are actually designing for something that exists, you still have to do the research. So there was a difference between attitudes and behaviors, and from these we get the user interviews and field studies. So for during the next two weeks, when the event is approaching, and you, you get to know the, the different uh, uh, domains that are, are designed for, uh, go and meet five users and do this exercise. Not necessarily like with them, like you don't have to take them together and, and do the posters, but do the research that you can then accurately depict them using these two tools that you learned today. And these are the two most valuable design tools that uh, anyone can um, teach to you guys. And uh, anything else? I guess that's, that's it, yeah. So now it's up to you. It's going to be a hackathon that is a failure like any other hackathon before that, or you will do the research and be highly successful in two weeks of time. And I'm completely confident that you can do that. You did a really, really good job. So on my behalf, I, I would like to say thank you, and then I give the mic to uh, Tom. OK. So uh, Thomas, is, they are running uh, on the uh, Startup Sauna Accelerator program right now. And uh, they have uh, one tool that might help you to, to do research on specific uh, stage of, of this uh, problem definition. So. May I have a picture? Thank you. Forward? Yeah. Oh. Here we are. Fantastic. Okay, thank you very much, Yuska. Um, yeah, before you now actually go out and start doing your research, I uh, would like to take the opportunity to actually give a tool to you that I am convinced is going to be extremely helpful for, for the challenge you are facing because you want to you wanna get to talk to people, right? You want to get to understand what, how they behave, why they behave in that way, what their pain points are and what motivates them. And for that, you have to get to talk to them. But you only have two weeks for, to do so. And, that is, and it's going to be challenging for you, right? Because uh, finding a time slot where you can talk to people if you want to observe somebody is even going to be more challenging because you have to actually meet in time and space. And this is exactly what we focus on at Yellow. As uh, Yuska said, we are uh, part of the ex uh, Accelerator program here at Startup Sana. We came here last week. And we, ha we are from, from a very similar background. And the challenge or the problem we want to solve is to actually get a lot of qualitative information uh, in, a, in a short period of time. And we do this uh, with video online surveys, or as it is referred to in the design world, um, mobile ethnography, they also call it. So let me show you really quickly. It's a straightforward process. So when you go to yellow.io, I'll have the URL up later. <laughs> um, when you go there, you create an account and you create your question. So to find out wh what you need to find out. And input the question. This creates you a link that you can share uh, through email, WhatsApp, or Facebook. Um, I suggest you use these three channels. As these are the, the most stable ones. Um, and this is how people then going to get the question. So they open the link and on their mobile, in their web browser, they don't have to install any app or anything. They see your question and can immediately start recording their answer, which will then be sent back to you. You get all of them in, in a dashboard and actually can work with them and then derive your insights uh, from the videos you, you collect. Let me give you a few tips on how to, to actually work with Yellow, to work with the tool to, to get the most out of it. First of all is obviously the, the question, how you formulate the question um, dictates a lot how, well, what results are going to get. And obviously, and I'm not telling you any news that you shouldn't use yes or no questions because the beauty of this format is really that you can ask openly formulated questions that then people can answer in the most natural way they is there. They just talk. Um, so, but to, to give them a little help, uh, it works very well if you formulate the question related to an event they, they can recall. So instead of asking, what do you think of X, Y, Z, you would ask, tell me the story about the last time you did this and that, maybe when you sign up for the, the, the hospital, the medicine, medical service challenge would be, tell me about the last time one of your relatives uh, had to to get medical services. What was
try this mic. And it gets even more uh, powerful when you can actually accompany people in the event of that, that you want to research at. So instead of asking them, tell me the story about, actually take me to. If you signed up for the, for the insects, uh, food challenge, take me, to, take me to the supermarket. Show me packaging you think is, is ex builds trust. And, and always, of course, ask for why that is. Why, why people think this builds trust, or why they like such and such, or why it frustrates, uh, it frustrates them, or did uh, things like that. And then also, uh, make sure you brief people properly when you send them the link. So instead of posting it somewhere on Facebook, hey, I'm doing this project, it would be cool if you could participate, give them, give them enough information so they know what they sign up to. So first of all, um, tell them what you want to learn and why you want to do this. Uh, so they understand what they what they get themselves into, um, and and explain the concept because probably a video survey it's going to be the first time to hear of this. Uh, how you will use the video is obviously very important that it stays with you and that this is for this research project, and what is in for them. Now, obviously, I don't think you're going to offer any monetary reward or something, but in that case, it's really your your appreciation you you have for the help they're giving you. So. Make sure you, you stress that and make that clear. And then don't worry about reminding them after one or two days if you haven't got an answer yet. Uh, it's, it's perfectly fine. People are busy like, like you are. So give them a little reminder one or two times to, to make sure you get the results you want. So this is it. I now let you go. <laughs> do, do your work. Do your research. Maybe you want to take uh, a picture of this so you can really, you, you just go to yellow.io, you sign up for, for an account. We do this completely for free in exchange for your feedback afterwards. And if there's anything within, within those two weeks that, that you have questions with, if you, if you need any help, then feel free to, to reach out to me anytime. I'm, I'll be glad to help. Um, I don't know now. Axel, is there something more? Yeah, I'll say a couple words. Okay, so I thank you, uh, and I pass it on. Thank you, Roman. All right. Who has learned something new today? Anybody? Show some hands. Great. That was what we aimed for. We really wanted you to get something new out of this, really understand something new, and take it in so that you can actually now start applying this. Um, the main event is coming up in less than two weeks. So you now have time to do some research, understand your user, understand where your user uses the problem or where the user has its problems and, and all of that. What we hope you to do is just make sure that you spend this time a little bit of the time, the two weeks. Just, just take a couple of hours or so and actually think about and prepare yourself for the hackathon. Uh, doors will, or the registration for the event will open at 3 p.m. the 3rd of, uh, 3rd of November. So come here, be ready, bring your Everything that you, you need, we send out the information package to you. If you haven't received that, let us know. We'll send it again. And you'll get more information about your challenges in the upcoming days. But a big round of applause for everyone being here, everyone learning something today. All right, see you at Dash.